then has a joint appointment with the Department of Ecology and Institute on Ecosystems. So it's great to have him here. He's a uh, global modeler, ecosystem modeler, looks at things like carbon and water cycle, um, and works at scales from global to regional. He's going to talk about his work and where he thinks opportunities are. Just a little bit about Ben's background. He got his bachelor's at University of Idaho, his PhD at Duke University, and then he's been over in Europe for the last several years as a research scientist. He was a Marie Curie fellow uh, at the Swiss Federal Science Agency in Zurich, and then most recently he was in Paris at the Institute of Climate Science and the Environment. Yeah, so it's just a bit. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, I have a little bit of a cold, so uh, it's my voice is just a little hoarse. But um, anyway, so thanks for coming. Uh, so today uh, I'd like to kind of discuss um, the, the give kind of an introduction to the type of research that I do. And that uh, that I plan to do while at MSU, and uh, in terms of how I'm setting up uh, my, my research group, and uh, and put this kind of all in the context of um, the application of global carbon cycle models, uh, and and how we can use them uh, beyond uh, kind of traditional carbon cycle applications. So, um, so first, uh, I'll, I'll give uh, an, an introduction to how Earth system models and uh, and carbon cycle models are traditionally used to look at uh, climate impact uh, questions. And uh, the, uh, as I'll get into, the, the Earth System Modeling Framework is quite a bit different to um, uh, statistical approaches that are used to look at uh, species distribution shifts and, and climate impacts. And so um, I'll give uh, quite, a, quite a bit of detail on the, uh, the modeling framework um, for carbon cycle models, uh, focusing on this uh, DGVM acronym, the, uh, the Dynamic Global Vegetation Model. And then uh, I'll introduce uh, what, what I see as kind of a short list of interdisciplinary ap applications of, of uh, the DGBM framework uh, with a focus on uh, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And then hopefully we can have uh, time for some discussion and uh, some ideas brainstorming about uh, what else could be, could be done with this modeling framework. So. Um, as uh, most people are familiar with, uh, global temperature is increasing. The, uh, the fifth assessment report of the IPCC uh, is, is, is uh, currently releasing the new chapters. And uh, they, they summarize the uh, global air, uh, global surface temperature change of about one degree over the past century. And uh, you can see that uh, the, uh, in the high latitudes, uh, this temperature change is quite pronounced. Uh, but but um, uh, but, but generally, it's a global uh, phenomena. And um, with the latest uh, fossil fuel scenarios for the IPCC, uh, we're, we're looking at continued uh, warming trends. The, uh, the fifth assessment report designed the uh, fossil fuel scenarios around these RCP uh, scenarios, which, which are known as representative concentration pathways. And uh, they, they presented four different RCPs. Um, with these, uh, with these numbers following them. So you have uh, RCP 2.6 to RCP 8.5. And this refers to the, uh, the radiative forcing potential uh, in, uh, over the next 100 years that um, is associated with the greenhouse gas forcing. And, and basically, there's a high chance that um, under, under the, uh, the moderate and the high scenarios, that global air temperatures will exceed 2 degrees by the year 2100. <coughs> If we look at uh, the, the recent and the projected uh, surface air temperature changes uh, over, over the past uh, thousand years, uh, there's a nice summary uh, by the pages of uh, 2K consortium published in Nature uh, last, uh, last year, 2013, um, where, where uh, they show um, temperature reconstructions using a range of uh, proxy data sets, so tree rings, uh, sediment cores, and things like this, to show um, how temperatures has, has changed over the past uh, thousand years or so. And you can see that following kind of a, uh, uh, a cooling phase uh, 1,000 years ago, we, we've entered a rapid warming phase. Uh, and this is based on actual observations. And so it kind of coincides 
with the, uh, the meteorological data that we have showing uh, this warming over the past 150 years. <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the drivers of climate change then are changes in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And we have uh, quite robust data showing uh, changes in uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations. This is the, the, the famous record at the Mauna Loa Observatory showing uh, the uh, annual uh, CO2 concentrations in black and then the, uh, the monthly uh, CO2 concentrations in, 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 in red. And uh, in, in 2013, for the first time uh, on record, we exceeded uh, 400 ppm uh, in CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa. The, the Mauna Loa curve is, uh, is, is, is a very useful um, uh, data set that we have to describe the, uh, the bias curve because uh, it, the, the, the seasonal cycle here is driven by productivity of ocean and uh, terrestrial systems. And so in the northern hemisphere, where we have the uh, northern hemisphere summer, we tend to have a decrease in the, uh, the CO2 concentrations. And then in the northern hemisphere winter, we tend to have an increase in CO2 concentrations, uh, coinciding with increases in respiration, but also uh, decreases in carbon uptake from the synthesis. Uh, the the modern lower curve also shows uh, large-scale, uh, global-scale disturbances that have happened uh, over the past 40 years. And so we can see that with the Pinatubo eruption uh, in, in 1991, there was a, uh, a global cooling event. Also, um, uh, changes in uh, global radiation to a more diffuse uh, type of form of radiation uh, from, from the dust that had accumulated in the atmosphere. And so this, uh, this combination of cooler air temperatures and changes in radiation increased the, uh, the global land sink uh, and, and caused the modern era um, uh, rate of increase to, to slow down somewhat. And then uh, with the, uh, the El Nino in 97 and 98, uh, a combination of uh, warm temperatures and, uh, and, and stress for productivity, but also uh, large wildfires, particularly in uh, Indonesian uh, peatland systems, uh, contributed to the large chunk uh, CO2 concentrations. And then, uh, just to kind of superimpose the, the kind of the policy relevance of this of this figure, in uh, 1992, the, the UNFCC was developed. Uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was uh, proposed to avoid uh, dangerous climate change, and uh, and then the Kyoto Protocol was was negotiated and kind of briefly went into effect in, uh, I think, uh, 2007. Um, in, in addition to, uh, to CO2 increases uh, from, from fossil fuel emissions, we have uh, increases in other greenhouse gases. So uh, methane has increased approximately 150% uh, over the past uh, 100 years, and nitrous oxides have increased about 20%. Uh, the increase in methane is, uh, is, a, is a combination of um, fossil fuel burning, uh, biomass burning, uh, which, which releases methane as a trace gas, uh, changes in um, uh, uh, or increases in uh, the use of pasture animals, um, and, and so on. There's also some feedbacks from uh, warming on wetland methane emissions that are increasing, uh, that are contributing to this increase. And then with uh, nitrous oxides, the, uh, the application and the, uh, the invention of, of nitrogen um, fertilizer in the early 1900s has, has led to uh, ex extensive use of, of nitrogen and then uh, denitrification and nitrification processes contribute to uh, the increase in N2O concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, in addition to the greenhouse gas forcings, land cover change uh, also plays a role uh, locally that can have um, kind of important uh, global scale uh, climate feedbacks. So uh, this is a model of simulation by, by the Max Planck Institute, which shows uh, changes in surface temperature due only to biophysical feedbacks, um, which include um, changes in albedo as you uh, go from one land cover type to another, also changes in the uh, in transpiration that can affect the energy budget locally, and, and so on. And so you can see in, the, in Northern Europe, there's, a, there's been a cooling from land cover change uh, due to changes in albedo from forest cover to uh, cropland cover. And these uh, local um, kind of direct influences of, of land cover change on um, the, uh, the surface energy balance has, has then 
that back into changing climate in, in places like North, Northeast Siberia. Um, but uh, we, we can also look at the uh, kind of the biogeochemical, the carbon emissions from land cover change, which contribute to a, uh, a positive uh, change in global temperature. Um, but the, uh, but, uh, but the, so, 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 so sorry, so with the biophysical changes related to land cover change, we have uh, a slight cooling, so indicated here is so about 0 0.03 degrees Celsius cooling. With uh, the, the uh, uh, carbon emissions, uh, CO2 forcing on temperature change are about 0 0.2 uh, degree uh, influence on um, climate change or temperature changes, uh, but, and then the net uh, influence of land cover change is about 0.15. And, uh, and, and these, these other columns indicate kind of the uncertainty of uh, the role of land cover change on uh, changes in uh, surface air temperature. Um, so, we have, uh, so we have greenhouse gas forcing, land cover change forcings, uh, altering uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, the physics of the atmosphere. Um, so as, as I mentioned, the UN, the UN uh, 1992 um, set up the UNFCC to uh, prevent dangerous interference with the climate system. And uh, it was well known that greenhouse gases were increasing and that um, this could represent significant impacts on the climate and then feedbacks on the biosphere and on the oceans and on the, and on the cryosphere. And so um, a, a, a large amount of effort went into um, trying to set policy to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions with the idea that we should avoid some type of uh, temperature change uh, that would represent dangerous climate change. And so uh, uh, the, the German Advisory Council on Climate Change uh, did, did a very uh, rigorous uh, meta-analysis on um, looking at species shifts, uh, changes in uh, ecosystems and in, in coral reefs and so on, and, and looked at the relationships of these, uh, these impacts to changes in temperature that have been observed over the past 100 years. And uh, through this analysis, they developed a, a climate sensitivity uh, system for each of uh, the species and the ecosystems within this review. And they summarize uh, this review with, with this, uh, these, these figures, which are known as uh, burning embers. And the burning embers idea basically says that um, the, the darker shades of red indicate uh, greater and greater uh, causes for concern in terms of uh, climate impacts and negative climate impacts. And it was gener generally agreed that above uh, two degrees Celsius, um, the the, uh, the Earth system would start entering um, a, uh, a zone of dangerous climate change. And so, following uh, this this two degree target, uh, a lot of effort went into trying to understand how much, uh, or what concentration, or what what the uh, cumulative contribution of greenhouse gases um, could be in the atmosphere uh, before we. Uh, move beyond this two degree temperature change. And so um, this, was, uh, this analysis was based on the uh, fourth assessment report, uh, carbon cycle models coupled to atmospheric models. And so you can see uh, on, on the far right of the figure the names of the different uh, uh, carbon cycle models that were included. And then uh, you can see um, in the different colors on the different points of the figure, um, how much the, uh, the cumulative emissions could be before uh, the model predicts a uh, two degree or greater temperature change. And uh, through, through kind of a statistical analysis of this, this model ensemble, it was agreed that, um, that a, a, a cumulative target of one trillion tons in the atmosphere uh, was, was considered kind of a safe um, target and then exceeding the trillionth ton means that there's a high likelihood of exceeding two degrees temperature change and then uh, entering this realm of dangerous climate change. So, uh, um, so uh, the, uh, the, the, the rates of change in uh, the <coughs> ecosystems um, can either take place gradually, so you have <coughs> gradual migration of, of ecosystems and species or, or uh, gradual dieback of these species, but uh, there's also Kind of a field of thought based on the paleo records that the changes can take place uh, quite rapidly, uh, so within a decade or, or to 50 years. Um, and so, 
the uh, at the Paul Simon Institute for, for Climate Impact Research, they uh, they 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 kind of surveyed uh, experts in climate impact science to identify um, tipping elements in the Earth system, where a tipping element is defined as a uh, region where uh, a very small perturbation can kick off a very large and sudden uh, change in the system, and that that change is generally irreversible. And so um, the uh, the criteria was that these uh, tipping elements could be um, based on uh, th that the uh, the perturbation has to be uh, temperature related, and that the uh, the region has to also have uh, is be a region of um, of uh, high policy significance. And so, uh, for example, we have uh, the, the, the tipping element of the Amazon Basin. And this, this tipping element was recognized in the early 2000s by, by the Met Office, where they showed um, a, a, a very rapid uh, dieback of the tropical forests in this region. And, uh, and so this dieback was related to um, uh, increases in air temperature that led to forest mortality. Forest mortality led to a decrease in uh, transpiration. This decrease in transpiration led to a decrease in convective precipitation, which, which led to further droughts in the region and then further forest mortality. In the past 10 years, um, there have been two major uh, droughts in the Amazon Basin that were kind of one in 100 year droughts uh, that occurred in 2005 and 2010. And using uh, passive microwave data to kind of look at the, uh, the structure of the forest canopy over the Amazon basin, it's been shown that, that the Amazon still hasn't recovered from the, uh, the 2005 uh, drought episode. Uh, another tipping element that was identified was, was the, uh, the border forest region. Um, there was mixed uh, Observations and results coming from satellite data showing uh, large-scale greening of the boreal forest, particularly in uh, shrubland regions, but that there, there are these patches of uh, boreal forest dieback. And um, it's, uh, the, the, the common paradigm is that the, uh, the high-latitude systems are temperature limited. And so now that we see this very rapid warming of the high latitudes, uh, the, the main uh, limitation to growth is, is switching over to uh, to soil moisture and to drought or, or to soil moisture limitations. And uh, when we look at the, the tree ring record, we, we see this quite clearly. Uh, it's known as the, uh, the divergent problem. And so uh, prior to the 1970s, um, the correlation between temperature and annual uh, ring lengths and tree rings uh, was, was, was very high. And so we use this relationship to reconstruct temperature uh, uh, before the, uh, the, the observational record, so for paleoclimate reconstruction. And then after the 1970s, we see a divergence between the correlation of tree growth and uh, annual temperature. And so it's thought to be because other climate limitations are coming into play. And then uh, another kind of tipping element uh, that they identify is this, uh, the Sahara Green. The, uh, the greening of dryland systems is not just limited to, uh, to, to the Sahara. This, this image is from Australia. And what we've seen over the past 30 years is that a lot of, uh, uh, in, uh, in a lot of dryland or semi-arid systems where, where any precipitation is less than about 500 millimeters per year, we actually see a greening trend. And it's some combination of uh, shrub encroachment to these systems and uh, also to, to changes in productivity of grasslands. And uh, there are several hypotheses for why this might be happening. Uh, some are related to changes in the, the use of uh, pasture animals in these systems, allowing for, for shrub encroachment, which I think is quite common in uh, the Western US. But other ideas are related to changes in the water use efficiency in arid systems as uh, CO2 increases and affects uh, stomal uh, conductance. So this is me. Um, <laughs> I wanted to kind of give a sense of uh, <laughs> how I got to uh, become a carbon cycle modeler. And uh, uh, I do come from England, which explains the, uh, the accent somewhat. Um, <laughs> and I had to wear shorts until I was five feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and the best school would allow us to wear uh, trousers, even in winter. So, uh, um, so, so as Kathy mentioned, um, 
I, uh, I, I went to uh, University of Idaho for my undergraduate studies. And uh, I worked with John Marshall, there, an ecophysiologist, uh, looking at the relationships, uh, the relationship between carbon distance and altitude. Um, globally, we see this uh, phenomenon where uh, isotopic discrimination decreases at higher elevations. And there's lots of hypotheses why uh, this might be the case. And so while, while I was doing my, my, my undergrad research on this topic, uh, I came across a uh, article in the same uh, journal that I was, I was looking at the uh, this leaf scale processes at. And uh, this is by Peter Bertusek in uh, 1994, describing um, kind of the interaction between all of these global change processes on the biosphere and the consequences that they may have. And so this, this article focused on uh, deforestation, elevated CO2 and nitrogen deposition at uh, kind of global to global scales. And, um, and it really inspired me to start thinking kind of at these, these, these larger scales in terms of the, the processes um, um, coming from that are directly human driven to uh, have indirect effects on, on the physiology. And then um, I, I spent quite a bit of time doing field work uh, on biodiversity in the tropics and then also working at, on, on some experiments at, at Stanford at the Jasper Ridge Global Change Experiment where they were applying uh, heat, water, CO2, and nitrogen treatments to, uh, to a, gra a grassland there. And there's a picture of Ashley Ballantyne. Uh, he and I did some work on, on tree rings in coastal North Carolina to, to look at forest dieback in this region um, as, as it's related to sea level rise and fire disturbance. And then my last uh, field trip was in coastal North Carolina, and we were searching for oak growth Atlantic one cedar. And um, this, was, this was in a very remote, inaccessible uh, ecosystem known as uh, a Pocosin swamp. And so Pocosin was uh, absolutely brutal <laughs> place to work. And, uh, and this is why we actually thought there might be old growth Atlantic white cedar. Um, and, and so we found trees that were like really massive, but they're only about 50 years old. <laughs> and so, um, and we also got stuck in the Pocosin swamp, which was a little bit scary. Because uh, we went in with the GP, well, we, we kind of wandered in, and then uh, then we tried to take the direct route back, and it was blocked by green briar and, and uh, canals and things like this. So, um, so, so that's my challenge. Now you can jump by grills, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, then I switched to a computer model. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, so I decided to want to okay, apply the impacts of tropical systems. So, focusing on this Amazon dieback issue, uh, and then. Um, and then kind of with global, looking at um, land cover and, uh, and, and how we're using uh, different land cover maps to initialize uh, models or to, um, to look at annual kind of time series of land cover change and how this affects carbon emissions. Um, and, and the amazing thing about the land cover work is that most, most of the, uh, the international teams are using land cover data sets that are, that are about 20 years old. Uh, so they're based on these, these are Olson biomes from... Uh, the mid 80s. So, uh, so we've done a lot of work trying to get the community to use more recent land cover data sets. And then at uh, LSE, um, we focus more on uh, forest management at global scales, uh, particularly with their forest recovery from uh, disturbance. <coughs> so, um, so the Earth System model, let's see, okay, so the Earth System model um, kind of looks like this. Uh, we have, uh, we, we break the world up into two-dimensional tiles to represent uh, the land surface. And then we have three-dimensional tiles to represent the ocean and, uh, and the atmosphere. And, um, and, and, and the, the, the schematic on the, on the right shows how we can couple what's happening with the biosphere uh, with the atmosphere through feedbacks from the land surface energy budget um, and, and other land surface properties, such as, such as albedo. And so we have a range of um, biosphere models or, or land surface models. Uh, and so we have things like LPJ, which was developed in Sweden and Germany. We have CLM, which is uh, developed by, by NCAR in the US. We have ORCID-A from France. Then we have STGBM from, from the UK. And, um, uh, and, and so generally, you can see that each country tends to have their own carbon cycle model, which meant that working in Europe exposed me to, uh, to a lot of different kind of philosophies about how we can model uh, the biosphere. And so this was, was in hindsight, uh, a real advantage for, 
for spending time there. The, um, the, uh, the, the problem, though, is that um, we have imperfect knowledge about how um, processes uh, take place in the biosphere. And so um, because we're missing information, we have to make assumptions about how to represent uh, different processes. And uh, this results in uh, kind of very different feedbacks to, to climate change uh, when, we, when we run these models out to the future. And so then this is a very famous figure from uh, Pierre Friedenstein summarizing the, uh, the fourth assessment report coupled carbon cycle models. And each, each column is a different uh, carbon cycle model. And you can see that some, uh, the blue line in particular, suggests that uh, the uptake of carbon will become uh, extremely strong in the next 100 years. And to, just for kind of a context, uh, they're, they're saying that there would be a 10 billion ton uptake of carbon by 2100. And that this is equal to today's total fossil fuel emissions. So it's quite significant. Uh, but then the, uh, the Hadley Center model in black uh, predicts a uh, dieback of the Amazon forest. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of work is going into trying to, uh, to, try to reduce this uncertainty. And in the, uh, the fifth assessment report, uh, the, the spread is, is just the same or maybe larger. So, uh, so it's not, the agreement is not improving. Um, and this just shows that if, uh, if, if we're positive that this, uh, the land is taking up more carbon from photosynthesis, then it's losing through respiration and disturbance. Um, and so uh, DGPMs are, are a relatively recent uh, modeling tool. Uh, they, they, they really, they, and they build a lot, uh, they build uh, on um, the past 100 years of kind of ecological modeling science. And um, this figure by Colin Prentice, one of kind of the key developers of, of the DGBM framework, uh, summarizes how um, DGBM to relate to, uh, to human uh, kind of socioeconomic models. So the image model is used to uh, develop the, uh, the fossil fuel scenarios that, that go into the IPCC assessments. And so they take into account things like uh, GDP um, uh, and, and other kind of international treaties to look at how intensive the management of the biosphere might be. Uh, DGVM is also built off of uh, uh, bi biogeography models. Um, so things like the Holdred Life Zone, so the Köppen uh, climate classification system plays some role in the DGVM. Uh, they also build off of uh, the physiology and biogeochemistry models. Uh, so, so things like uh, the light use efficiency models of the Miami and CASA um, uh, systems have, have some influence on what DGBMs are doing. And then um, DGBMs also take a lot of concepts from forest gap models. Uh, so here you can see the uh, kind of like very early work um, done by, by Watt at all, looking at, at, at landscape patterns, forest patterns, and then some of the more recent work from the early, from the mid 1970s um, from uh, Daniel Botkin and the Jabola model. And then there's also some biophysics, so again going back to albedo, surface roughness, um, and, and energy gallops that go into DGMs. Um, and so, so this is a schematic of the, uh, the LPJ DGBM and how everything kind of flows together. Basically, we have uh, the LPJ, we have uh, daily or sub-daily processes. Uh, so these are represent, these are referred to as the fast uh, processes. So things like photosynthesis, respiration, uh, carbon allocation. And then we have the slow processes related to disturbance and vegetation dynamics. Um, and so I uh, just kind of walk through uh, some of the processes in more detail because this figure is, is, is kind of abstract and I'm hoping people will become more familiar with DGVM as well. <laughs> I'm trying to get people excited. So, um, so, basically, so basically for a DGVM, the first step is uh, to get the climate data sets ready. And so uh, uh, we, many things like atmospheric CO2 concentration, things like uh, radiation, short wave radiation and long wave radiation. Uh, surface air temperature, precipitation, and then uh, soil information. And then, then we let the model um, based on equations and physics, uh, physical processes inside the model, determine uh, which, uh, which species or 
you know, which species or PFTs, so this plant functional type concept, which, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, we let the model decide which um, species uh, can establish, and then we let the model decide how they grow and uh, compete with one another. Um, so, so here's kind of the establishment module. Basically, the model is uh, using bioclimatic limits uh, to check whether a, uh, a species can establish. And then it checks for how much space is available within the grid cell to, uh, to throw out uh, a number of individuals. And then um, the models are run at a daily or sub daily time step. And so they uh, estimate how much uh, leaf area is available uh, for photosynthesis to take place. And so the phenology modules are using things like um, growing degree day suns, uh, soil moisture, uh, and radiation to determine uh, the phenological status of, uh, of, of the species. Um, and then models calculate photosynthesis. Um, most of the DGVMs are using a, a, a biochemical model designed by uh, Farquhar. And so this, this model um, is, is semi-mechanistic, and it determines things like uh, maximum carboxylation capacity of the leaf uh, as a function of uh, temperature and uh, radiation and CO2. And then it calculates actual photosynthesis from the species max um, throughout the day. Uh, associated with, with photosynthesis, the models are explicitly um, describing the model conductance, so, uh, which is important for calculating how much CO2 diffuses through the leaf. And so as the snow lakes are open, then we can use that information to calculate uh, the water losses through the leaf to the atmosphere. And then uh, we, we deduct from the growth photosynthesis uh, the, the, uh, the total autotrophic respiration of the plant. So this includes uh, things like maintenance respiration, as well as uh, growth and reproductive um, costs. So then the, uh, the net carbon, carbon increment is then allocated to uh, different carbon pools. So we have things like uh, the leaf uh, biomass pool, uh, sapwood, if it's, if, it's, if it's a tree, uh, and, and root biomass pools. And this allocation is done to, uh, to kind of optimize um, uh, the response of the plant to, to local resource limitations. So if there's drought stress, then more biomass will be allocated below ground. And then we have uh, a dynamic soil decomposition uh, module. So, so most of the models are using something like this uh, century model, which uh, uh, splits the soil carbon into three or four different turnover rates and, uh, and models soil carbon accumulation. And then, uh, then we get back into the vegetation dynamics. And we look at mortality related to uh, temperature stress, or um, mortality related to changing climate, and bioclimatic limits are shifting over time. But we can also have direct mortality from, from fire or from uh, deforestation. And then finally, uh, we, can, we can kind of couple these models with agricultural modules, uh, with uh, river flow networks to look at um, our, our river flow dynamics over long time scales, and then also with uh, wetland models. So one, one critical issue uh, that the models have to deal with, in addition to having kind of a lack of uh, full information, uh, is this issue of scale. And so if, if we want to run these models over you know, 100 to 1,000 year time frames and at uh, global spatial scales, then uh, we have to uh, aggregate a lot of the processes that are happening locally <laughs> to be able to make things uh, computationally uh, feasible. Um, and then also, again, if we, if we don't fully understand a process at the mechanistic level, then we have to make some kind of empirical um, uh, description of what that process is doing. And so I'd like to just use the example of vegetation dynamics uh, of, of a scaling issue in ecology, because it's something that um, we've been unable to really solve effectively. Um, and so, so here's our, our real forest. We have lots of different individual trees. And uh, if we were to kind of zoom out to look at the landscape, and we would see that the landscape is quite heterogeneous in terms of um, uh, the, the species just the species that are within a landscape and the ages of those species, or the, the number of cohorts within, within uh, uh, a species across that landscape. And so, so that models, uh, kind of the first stage of, uh, of forest dynamics modeling, uh, we're able to kind of represent 
the, the number of individual species, and then you could run a gap model you know, a couple of hundred times to represent what's happening at the landscape scale. Um, and then this was kind of the starting point, a very, a very kind of um, brute force way to, uh, to look at uh, vegetation dynamics and, and computationally expensive. Uh, at the global scale, you know, the plant functional type concept was uh, developed. Um, which is basically a, uh, a way to aggregate uh, species traits into a very small number of, um, of plant functional types. And so those models represent the world's 300,000 species by about 10 to 12 plant functional types that have different uh, phenology, uh, different photosynthetic pathways, and things like this. So the first stage for them, for the gap model to the DGVM, was the PFT. And then um, and then also this idea of the mean individual. And, and so what this, what this uh, equates to is that all the physiological processes that I've described pre previously uh, take place for just a mean representative individual. And then um, this, uh, those processes, they get scaled to the whole grid cell by simply multiplying the, the, uh, the population density uh, by, by, the, um, by, the, by, the, uh, by the mean individual, and then scaling this way. And so with the DGVM, you don't have uh, any landscape heterogeneity, and you also don't have any uh, uh, diameter distributions or individual trees because everything's represented by its mean individual. So um, there, there's, there's been some work to try to figure out how we can uh, how we can represent this landscape heterogeneity and uh, and have diameter distributions and cohorts uh, within a DGVM at large scales and also be computationally efficient. And as I mentioned, with a traditional GAN model, you have to run it maybe uh, 50 to 100 times to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to average out the stochasticity uh, and, and to, um, to be able to represent the landscape um, uh, by geography and by geochemistry. And so, so the, the tree made approach and the ecosystem demography approach were developed um, to give uh, kind of simple solutions to all that stochastic information so that you would only have to run the gap model once to represent all this uh, landscape heterogeneity. <coughs> but, but the problem is that you have to make a lot of assumptions um, about how to handle um, what, what we call approximation errors that come into uh, these deterministic solutions. And so, so this figure is basically showing that uh, with, with the tree make approach, we, uh, we coupled tree make this deterministic gap model with the biogeochemistry of LPJ. And we had to do this using a, a high class approach, so HC is high class, where we have discrete high classes describing the different cohorts within our stand. And um, we had to make approximation uh, kind of trade offs uh, when a tree did not grow outside of its high class we, uh, or, or within a certain threshold outside of its high class. Um, the tree would then remain in its original high class. And, uh, and, and the carbon that had accumulated that for that growing season would basically be um, uh, ignored. And so it wasn't a very it's not a very satisfactory approach if, you, if you're looking at um, uh, kind of the biogeochemistry of the system. Um, and then on a new approach with the, uh, with the Orchid A model, this uh, forest management FM, this um, was, was developed to basically take uh, the, the, the stand level productivity and downscale this to individual trees. And um, so this is a separate issue to the landscape heterogeneity issue. Uh, it's addressing the, the tree diameter and the cohort mm -hmm. issue. And what this does is it takes, um, it uses a, a uh, empirical approach, uh, kind of described here by the, the sigma and gamma, to, um, to take uh, your standard level biomass increment and then apply this to uh, large and small trees. And the assumption is that the larger trees grow faster than smaller trees, and these uh, two coefficients are fitted to forest inventory data. Hmm. And what this means is that we can simulate um, at the half hourly time scale for Orchid A to stand level productivity, and then um, uh, downscale this annually to a population of individual trees. But with enough computing power, we could just simply use the LPJ gas model, which um, which gives us cohorts, and it gives us species level simulations, and, uh, and it does the gap dynamics, and we don't have to worry about these approximation errors and, and, and so on. Um, and so 
th this is so so. This, this, the, the difficulties that the community has had with uh, the, the scaling issues associated with vegetation dynamics are now becoming kind of less important as uh, computer clusters become cheaper and, uh, and more efficient for, for, for ecosystem modeling. And so, so basically, the LPJ guess model is a forest gap model. So we have to have these stochastic simulations. So we, we need to represent the landscape through 20 to 80 different simulations per, per um, uh, per grid cell, so we have 20 to 80 patches. Uh, but we can also look at uh, species dynamics, and uh, within a species, we can look at the different cohorts within that patch. So uh, this is just an example of of the kinds of things we can do with LPJ guess. Uh, it, it's fairly standard. Let's see if this. But, but basically, this is this is just for a, um, a region in British Columbia where Jed Kaplan uh, ran LPJ guess for different climate change scenarios, and um, and so what you would see would, would be the subalpine fir moving into higher elevation regions, and then you would see kind of decreases in the high elevation grasses um, as as the subalpine fir uh, becomes more productive where they are. Um, we also used LPJ guess. To look at uh, land management issues in Switzerland, uh, so so there's been this kind of historical legacy of, of litter raking, where uh, tons of litter would be raked out of the forests each year to provide bedding for um, for for, for um, pasture animals in the winter. And so what we did was to run LPJ guess simulating the removal of litter, and then calculate the uh, the total carbon sink potential across across Switzerland. Uh, when we coupled LPJ gas with a, a litter demand uh, model. And so we estimated that the Swiss soils were about 150,000 uh, tons of, of uh, depleted in, in carbon. And this is, this is about equal to you know, 1,500 hectares of, of ground biomass for this region. And so, um, so for the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, what, what we've been working on. Um, is to uh, develop an archive of uh, climate data sets where we'll downscale uh, climate projections to about one kilometer spatial resolution. And uh, we are currently parameterizing LPJ guess for the species that, that grow in this region. Uh, these, these are just individual points or plots where uh, these species have been observed with the US uh, forest inventory analysis. And then we've sampled uh, different climate data layers to, uh, to, to um, Develop bioclimatic limits for these uh, different species. There's also this uh, plant traits database known as TRI, um, hosted by the Max Planck Institute, where they have around 3 million uh, entries describing things like uh, specific leaf area, BC max, uh, diameter height for, for different species uh, around the globe. And then uh, we work on getting an MSU computer cluster. All right, so basically, I think ours will be like one rack. <laughs> But uh, but anyway, we're getting it. But it should be it'll be very it'll be state of the art, really powerful, and um, uh, and and we're anticipating to generate a lot of data through these simulations. So, in the order of ten to twenty terabytes. Um, so basically, to to kind of wrap up, then the uh, so so to me, the, the Great Yellowstone ecosystem represents uh, one of the largest natural systems uh, uh, that that's kind of still relatively intact in the, in the globe. But it's also a uh, very heavily managed uh, ecosystem. And so there's, there's a range of disturbances that interact with one another and the climate uh, that shape uh, species distributions, including plants as well as uh, animals. And so, so one of the, the kind of overarching questions then is uh, how, how can management be used to either promote resilience of the system or to help the system adapt to, uh, to climate change? And how can we use LPJ gas? Kind of realize the consequences of, of, of this on biogeochemistry, biogeography, and, and biophysics. And, and just to kind of illustrate some of the things that we hope to do with LPJ guess, um, we, we plan to develop uh, new disturbance modules. Um, we we uh, aim to, to, uh, to kind of regionalize the existing fire model that's with LPJ guess, but then also introduce uh, insect disease and wind disturbance modules uh, to, to LPJ guess based on. The, uh, the field data and, and observations and experiments that have been conducted uh, to date. Um, 
with the fire with the fire module, we can also look at it on some of the trace gases, including those that are, are precursors to, to ozone formation, or, um, or or gas like or, or things like black carbon, uh, which have direct consequences for human health. Um, there, there's been uh, in the past year or so a lot of discussions about how we can improve the representation of, of soil physics within these models, uh, in particular erosion, and uh, and then also linking kind of upland to, um, uh, to 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 lowland to stream network uh, fluxes of carbon within the system. Um, as I mentioned, the, the the models represent or can represent crops and pasture dynamics. And so we, we can look at the feedbacks of, of these uh, systems of climate change. And then uh, we can address issues associated with uh, timber management that uh, have kind of indirect um, relationships with CO2 fertilization uh, and, and how this affects productivity, hydrology, and uh, nutrient cycling within the system. Uh, CO2 fertilization is also associated with um, uh, changes, increases in water use efficiency. And so we, we can also look at things like changes in runoff with the model to see whether uh, sensitivity of the model for, for things like water use efficiency is, is, is realistic compared to what's happening at the full ecosystem scale. So, um, so these this are some people in the group. And uh, so we have uh, Zhang is coming from, uh, from China. And so he'll be working with LPJ to, um, uh, to work in particular on uh, methane emissions from, from tropical wetlands and from fire. Um, Francis is an uh, undergraduate looking at uh, the plant trait databases to parameterize LPJ for gray yellow stone ecosystems. JD is um, working with the climate data sets and, uh, and, and kind of the technical issues associated with getting these data sets ready for the, for the model simulations. Kristen will be coming to work with LPJ guests, and uh, Nicola will also be joining to. Um, Work with this uh, forest management module, um, looking in particular how we can use process-based models to, to address uh, carbon sequestration in uh, the tropics. So, um, thanks for your attention. These people are located. Where are they all going to be here? They'll be here. Mm -hmm. So JD and Francis are here now. JD is right here. <laughs> I get to call you Angus Young for wearing those shorts. Yeah, right. I was wondering if you could speak a little more specifically about how the model treats soil moisture storage in topography. Right. So, um, so, so, uh, so topography is, is uh, with these class of models, topography is ignored in terms of how it affects things like runoff and, and uh, subsurface flows. But uh, the models typically have like a two-layer bucket of uh, representation of soil hydrology. So you have, you know, you have infiltration and the movement of the water from one the upper, the upper bucket to the lower bucket. Um, but that it doesn't take into consideration things like slope. Uh, so then the, when we do run the model to look at things like river runoff, and, uh, we we um, we do take into consideration slope at that scale, but there's not a feedback into kind of the drainage. Do you think that limits your ability to come up with an appropriate average vegetation for high relief terrain? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so, so one of the one of the challenges with using LPJ guess at, at a one kilometer scale will be how we will be about how we represent all the spatial processes, so things like disturb dispersal. And, uh, and then disturbance to how fire spreads from one grid cell to another, and then the hydrology. And so this, um, so this represents a whole kind of challenge for how we parallelize the jobs on the cluster to make sure that things are communicating when they have to. But, but, but in the present setup, the, um, uh, the spatial processes are generally ignored for, for most of the models. So, Sha? Um, you know you're saying that the the plant responses are calculated for a daily time step. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how does the, like the climate, how, how does that look for a daily time step? You, you have, you know, uh, okay. of the year, but how's that building up? Uh, um, the, um, it can be done in different, in different ways. So, so for example, with LPJ, we use uh, monthly climate inputs, and then um, we uh, interpolate temperature, to just a simple interpolation between the monthly memes. 
to get the daily temperature. But for precipitation, we, uh, we have an, an additional input for the number of wet days in a month. And then um, the number of wet days in a month is used to disaggregate the, uh, the precipitation to those number of days. And then those, number, those days occur randomly throughout, throughout the month according to, to a weather generator. And then some, some models use, um, uh, like Orkney uses um, six hourly climate data. So you can get six hourly global climate data from uh, reanalysis products. So reanalysis is kind of a hybrid of observations and, uh, and, and a simulation. And so in that case, you, you don't have to do the, the weather generator for the daily information. Uh, You're interested in photosynthesis. And then respiration. Yeah. And the respiration was the respiration of the plants themselves. Mm -hmm. and then you brought in soil respiration. Right. Are animals of any use in the world? Respiration? Respiration. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, for methane, there are. So <laughs> this is a big, uh, I mean, methane is uh, around, well, I, mean, I think it's around like 10 teragrams of methane is produced from, from ruminants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so wetlands are uh, about 200 teragrams, and then cattle are about 10 teragrams. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, so it's not really, gigantic. Well, not gigantic, yeah. but I mean, you know, the, you know, the intraannual anomalies could be mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. but, you know, why? Do the, the long-term projections into the future about climate modeling take into account things like species invasion? Or it seems like in yeah. places like Hawaii, where you have nitrogen-fixing invaders, could totally change your predictions in terms of now you've got this new functional soil right. season in the system. That, is that something people think about? Or? No, no, not for invasives, because, because uh, the, the, the coupled runs are all done with um, the plant functional types. And so you only have 9 or 10 PFTs. But what we could do with that ridiculous with invasives. And so we could, uh, yeah, we could, we could look at how the energy budget responds to to invasive species, you know, does that mean cheatgrass would be an obvious one to look at? Mm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I guess in the same vein, is there any capability to look at uh, disturbance like fire and, and how that would affect vegetation? Mm. Yeah, uh, like in GYU, for example, you know, fire return interval comes shorter. Um, yeah, so, so, Katie, so Katie and I are looking at this in, in, in Andy Hansen's group, and so on. Um, we are, uh, um, so there's the fire module that we're, we'll be putting into LPJ gas is, is referred to as Spitfire. Mm -hmm. And basically, Spitfire simulates uh, the ignitions from, from lightning and, and uh, from human sources. And then, uh, and then it simulates the spread of fire within a system based on the fire danger index, uh, the fuel loading, so the model's calculating the litter um, uh, biomass. And then, uh, then we have to, we can model things like the fuel bulk density and then how this goes into the spread, and then, and then fire effects. And so Spitfire, the standard version, has determined. So we calculate the, um, the heat that's emitted from the fire, so the model can, can do this internally. And then that is related to um, tree mortality based on things like canopy height and bark thickness. So, uh, and then, then, then this obviously responds to whatever climate change scenario that you're feeding the model with. So, yeah. And we compare the human dimension, so we could say, okay, let's you know, the, the ignition source is, is, is one of the biggest pieces of uncertainty for, for Spitfire, but we can kind of manipulate that and act as, as managers in the system. And then, um, so okay, what happens if we suppress fire? What happens if we introduce too much fire? Is the climate changing rapidly? And, and so on. What about volcanic eruptions? Does it take into account that? Possibility. Uh, so the first thing, the climate force would have would have it. So things like radio. Well, uh, yeah, I think that radiation is changing. Uh, do, do, then depends. But uh, the, but the, 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 with the Pinatubo eruption, uh, there's been some really cool work about how the change in diffuse radiation really stimulated <laughs> photosynthesis. Um, and then from just a physical perspective, the soil physics. Uh, the, the main issue is that we assume that the soil structure um, stays the same over the duration of the entire simulation. So even people doing policy length simulations assume that the soil physics is the same. And so, um, 
So, so, so as I mentioned, there's been some interesting discussions about putting in a soil erosion uh, module to, uh, to, to look at how texture would change and how that feeds back onto water holding capacity and then how that would affect our geography. Uh, yeah. That was actually my kind of question. Yeah. Uh, your, that interesting case of Switzerland and the raking of the leaves, right. you know, to me, that's something that just happens on every single landscape by right. rovers or runoff or landsliding or right. debris flows. And so my question is going to be, to what extent should that be incorporated or is it? Um, but that's sort of the next step. Yeah, I mean, it's huge because we, when, when we initialize the model, we're starting with um, uh, so it's so all of the carbon pools for the soil and the vegetation are, are set to zero, you know, in, in year zero. And so we run a, uh, a, a run to bring all those pools into equilibrium. So we're recycling a climate climatology for, for a couple of thousand simulation years. And then, and then we typically launch kind of the, the simulation starting in 1901, assuming that the Earth system is in equilibrium in, in 1900. <laughs> And so, uh, so, so, so we have, you know, we have completely the wrong soil carbon stocks, and then this affects the sensitivity of the biosphere to temperature and so on. So, um, uh, so, so an idea, you know, had been to take the work we we we've done in Switzerland and kind of scale that up to to Europe, where litter raking was also quite extensive in different countries, and try to get that into the spin up uh, to make, you know, to, to to avoid this assumption of equilibrium. Uh, yeah, I wonder uh, this, if you're incorporating plant trait data sets into the, the model, does that mean that you're moving away from plant functional types, or are you are the right, is there a static distribution of traits within a plant functional type? How do you relate? Yeah, it's really it's really problematic. So the uh, they've, there's been some really nice work with this tri database, saying okay, um, we'll take all the um, uh, the information on specific leaf area. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll make like a histogram to show uh, when you take that species level and, and put it into the plant functional types just to look at the, the variance within, within um, the, the, the PFT if you're parameterizing it from actual data. And uh, the, the spread is huge and the overlap between PFTs uh, is, is also incredibly large. Uh, and um, the, uh, I think it's at the... Um, the, the, well, they, they show that the, uh, the, the variance of a trait uh, within a PFT um, can be larger than kind of the, uh, the, the variance, or, sorry, the variance of a trait within a PFT uh, is not explained very well at all, basically. <laughs> so <laughs> if you do the comparisons about how you aggregate all the traits and then look at how much of that is, the, the trait variance is explained by PFTs. And uh, it, it kind of indicates that the concept is not doing very well. And uh, but I mean, like another interesting issue there is that you know, so with the, with the, the CLM model, uh, Gordon Bonin has a really nice paper showing that if you use a trait database to get things like VC maps and then put these values into the, to the PFTs, they uh, they did this and they showed the model um, worked uh, um, less well when they actually when they use actual measured VC max. Values, but then uh, they realized that if they were to do that, the assumptions about um, having a single layer or multi-layer radiation scheme in the model became much more important. So then they, they changed the whole radiation scheme in the model, and and uh, and then used the trait database to get the VCMAX values, and they they saw much greater improvement in the model. So um, um so it's not a, it's not a kind of scaling issue. So. so so the way that radiation models have been developed have, have had all these scaling assumptions built onto them, and uh, and that doesn't directly translate then to actual measurements that you might be making in the field. So, yeah. One last question. Yeah. One, one last question. You showed us a gross schematic for this whole system. Yeah. And now we're talking about lots of uh, modules that you can change and fit in and so on. Your gross scheme, uh, I'm uh, from the way you present it, I think that people in China are using it in Australia and so on. And what do you, th so is that true? Yeah. That many people are. Right. How will that gross scheme evolve through time? Well, um, do you, is that a question I mean, you can address? I mean, it's, so some, um, 
some of these, you know, it's maybe mid it's around maybe 20, 15 or 20 DGVMs globally. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, and in some groups, uh, the, the code, you can just email and they send you the code. And then you can do whatever de developments mm -hmm. you have in mind. Some, some groups, uh, you have to set up more of a formal collaboration. And so, so the trade-off is that with a totally open source code, then anyone can do it. And uh, you know, we can make advances, but then that comes at the cost of, of not having all that work be synchronized to make um, advances in a more kind of coherent way. So, um, uh, so it's, yeah. So I, I mean, so, so traditionally, you know, these models are coming out of the uh, uh, the major you know, Earth System labs within each country, mm -hmm. and so that that. Those those labs are the ones that then contribute to things like IPCC mm -hmm. to maintain some kind of standard. Mm -hmm. but, um, Thank you. Yeah. Was that is that answer your question? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> right. Great, Ben. Thanks a lot.